was such a committed Christian on our college campus that when I was dating somebody who was not a Christian, he, uh, he introduced me to Scott and then he said, if I ever became a Christian, he's the most real Christian on this campus, I would want to be like him. And uh, the next year, I was looking for something to challenge me in my faith, uh, ran into Scott at a, at a dance, and um, he began to pepper me with questions about the existence of God. Um, I thought maybe he had lost his faith over the summer, so I did my best to answer, and then at the end sort of said, you know, how about you? And he was like, oh yeah, I, I believe in God. I said, why did you question me like that, you know? And, and he said, I wanted to see what you were made of. Let's take a walk. And on the walk, he told me about Young Life, this ministry that he was so committed to that I knew had brought my own dad to Christ. What I didn't realize was it was Pittsburgh Young Life that my father brought that far east to go to seminary. And it was Pittsburgh Young Life that had touched his heart and was that final piece um, that had drawn him to a commitment to our Lord. And so I, I signed up. I mean, I was intrigued by him, but I really wanted to be a part of this ministry. And so he really brought the light of Christ in a very powerful way by challenging me to pray hard, to be generous with my time, 20 hours of volunteer work a week. And then, of course, um, as we spent time together, we, we began to fall in love. He told me we didn't have time to, to get serious that year. <laughs> Maybe the next year we could date, and, um, and yet he did have designs on asking me to, to be his mate for life, and, um, and my heart was, was ready. Um, in sem we went to seminary right after our marriage, and uh, our wedding, sorry, and um, many times Scott challenged me with the, the deeper truths that he was learning about, um, sharing articles, sharing books, um, asking me if I had thought about things in a particular way. And he really helped light that fire in me to also do uh, a master's, different master's, but do a master's in theology. He was very supportive of that. Um, the difficulty was after seminary and after beginning his first pastorate, those questions continued to come. And it, be, it seemed to open a door to whether or not being... Presbyterian was where we were going to end up. And at that point, I was focused more on having our first child and then having our second child. And I did not want to be going that direction. You know, I always thought you could be Catholic and Christian, but who'd want to be? So <laughs> I did not. Um, and, and at the same time, the integrity with which Scott pursued his study of sacred scripture and his willingness to challenge himself, um, continued to open the door in the direction of and finally into the Catholic Church. Um, and as difficult as that was, and we chronicle it in Rome's Sweet Home, um, I, I also began to feel that I would shortchange God if I did not really study these things and weigh them seriously. And so his passion for the Word of God which was very, very consistent. And then his passion for Christ um, really began that process of opening my heart. Um, and then the Lord did a lot of work in my heart to open my eyes to the faith and draw me in. And since then, um, he came in in 1986. I came into the church in 1990. Um, we've had this incredible privilege of living the church's teaching on openness to life and being blessed with six incredibly beautiful and talented, faith-filled children. Uh, three of them are married and have chosen beautiful spouses. Two of them are pursuing the Catholic priesthood and, and one's still young and figuring out his vocation. Um, in addition, we've had three miscarriages and so we've walked through the reality of having our children go beyond, beyond us, before us. Um, and what a beautiful teaching in the Church of the Communion of Saints, um, even in our own family. And then the privilege we've had of speaking across the country, but also other countries, um, and, and sharing the faith side by side together. Um, and that's a way that Scott has been a light in my life, um, 
challenging me to go deeper in sacred scripture, challenging me to go deeper in my prayer life, um, challenging me to um, be generous with my time, generous with what we've learned, um, to share while we have breath and we figure probably we have eternity to rest. So that's not the main, <laughs> that's not the main thrust of, of our life is trying to figure out how to take it easy, but we really want to run through the tape um, in serving Christ side by side. Same, same question. Okay, let me wipe my eyes first. That was really moving, <laughs> that was beautiful. Okay, so why is she both light and life to me and many others? Well, I mean, first thing, I, I, I think of how it is that the luminous truth of the gospel has always moved my heart and mind, and in her I found a kindred spirit. Uh, we shared a partnership in reaching out to high school kids to evangelize, to catechize, to impart Bible studies and that sort of thing. And at every step of the way, I just felt our partnership was growing. And I, I knew that she was, uh, she was articulate, she was intelligent, uh, witty, uh, beautiful, <laughs> radiant. Uh, but I also had this sense that she had an integrity that wasn't just with me and others, but first and foremost with our Lord. And I remember our first year of marriage, uh, when I was wrestling with a passage in Leviticus 5 and Numbers 5 that dealt with restitution, and I shared with you about uh, things I had done as a juvenile delinquent back in high school, and I wasn't sure what to do to undo what I had done back then, and you were like, hey, we can't sit against the light. Whatever he gives us, we've got to respond to. And so it just strikes me that um, the illumination of God's Word is sort of what we have both been striving for for 40 years. But the other thing, too, that, I, that, that strikes me about light and life is the light of God's Word that came to her in an ethics seminar that, we were, that she was taking in graduate school and seminary. And she read Humane Vitae. And she wasn't even slightly predisposed to the Catholic faith or the authority of the, uh, the Catholic pontiff but she knew the truth when she read it. And so she shared with me and gently challenged me to open my eyes up to more light. And at the time, I wasn't just non-Catholic like you were. I was anti-Catholic. And so it occurred to me that there was just no way they would alone have this truth, and yet they did. And as discomforting as it was, it just struck us as being more light, more truth. And so uh, a greater challenge is always accompanied by more grace to respond to it. And so we did. At first, for me, it was just intellectual, but then I could see for her the real sacrifice of conforming to the truth would be embodied in her. And so, sure enough, when the two became one, the one we became was so real that we had to come up with a name for our firstborn. And he was not only the embodiment of our love, but also a kind of incarnation of this truth of openness to life that in so many ways opened my mind to much more truth than I was really looking for. And that was the fullness of the faith. And so when I went in pursuit of that light, and I found even more grace and truth in the Catholic gospel, I mean, she was a full-time mom. She had her MA, but she was really, you know, mothering full-time and homeschooling and all. And so uh, I came into the church with your permission. I mean, I, I said for me to disobey, you know, what I know to be true is feeling... For me to disobey what I know to be true is feeling, I forget exactly how I put it, I said. Uh, sinning against light. Yeah, for me to uh, not respond to this truth is sinning against the light. Yeah, it feels more like disobedience every day. And, and you freed me up. You said, okay, it was a reluctant kind of thing, but yeah. it, was whole, it was sincere and wholehearted. And so I, I look upon the path that I was uh, following into the Catholic faith feeling like she might never follow me, but feeling also that if she could ever find what I am finding, she would respond. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> uh, four years after me, but I mean, yeah. in some ways, four times more than me. Um, and so, you know, I, I just sense that 40-some uh, years ago when the, uh, the chaplain at our college heard that we were engaged, he kind of chuckled and said, you deserve each other. And my first thought was, I do not deserve her. But 40 years later, I realize now there is not another woman on this planet who I could have married 
and enjoyed life with. I mean, we've had ups and downs to be sure, but I didn't know that, you know, marriage and ministry could end up being this much fun and this much friendship and this much fulfillment. I mean, it's, it's a toss-up, you know, the word joy, uh, energy. Uh, what is the word for that kind of positivity? I guess it's hope. You always hope for the best. And I always try to believe that it's true, you know. But I, I would say uh, it is uh, a hope. Uh, she is the city councilman at large, the only official on the council that is elected by the entire city. And it was a three-way race the second round, and uh, she got 60% of the vote. And I think it's because she's a beacon of hope, not only for me and our family, but also for this whole city. Um, there is such a, a radiance about her, and also there is such a, a beautiful vision of what can be done if we just simply work together. And I mean, she's radiated that, she's communicated that to our six kids, our 18 grandkids. I have no doubt that the two sons of ours who are pursuing formation for the priesthood do it because they really have that shared hope that God will give them whatever they need to become faithful and holy priests. The, the word that comes to mind quickly is passionate. Um, passionate and wholehearted for, for Christ, first and foremost, for the truth of sacred scripture, and now definitely related to that, the Catholic Church. For me, um, I know that there are women who wonder if their husband ever thinks they're attractive or desirable or want, they want to spend time with them. And, and I can assure you, I hear the words all the time that Scott set his heart on me and continues to set his heart on me with great passion. <laughs> Passionate love for every one of our kids and our in-laws and our grandchildren. And I, I think the way that love is expressed in, in just so many different circumstances, different, different ways, is just a great, great blessing. You know, when I, uh, when I study Scripture, you can see clearly the distinction between the Old Covenant and the New. And those who conformed to the law of the Old Covenant got married, raised families, and followed the 613 commandments that are in the Torah that God gave Moses to impart to Israel. Uh, but Jesus was single and consecrated in his celibate and sacrificial life and sort of called his 12 to be the same. And so this was something novel, not just recent, new in the sense of, wow, we haven't seen that so much before. But I mean, uh, and then when you hear with that exchange between Mary and Martha, that she has chosen the one thing that's necessary. That is really the root of monasticism, monikos, that it is the one thing that's necessary to set your heart and mind upon the Lord your God and then to kind of let everything else just uh, find their place. And it seems to me that, you know, when we think and we talk and about the new evangelization and how is the gospel transforming Catholics in America or throughout the world, uh, you can tell by the confessional lines, you can tell by mass attendance, but I think in the long haul, the single greatest sign of deep conversion, and not just for individuals, but for groups, for cultures, is whether monasticism is flourishing. That kind of commitment, that experience of grace within a community, is to me the incarnation of what is so new about the new covenant even 2,000 years later. And when you study church history, when you look around the world, and you see the places where Christianity once flourished but left, why did it, why did it survive in certain areas, like in Egypt and elsewhere? It was because monasticism was flourishing. And it just sunk roots so deep that I think that is the key. Yeah, in the, in, in the Catholic family, you have something that is like a monastery. You know, you have a domestic church, you have a place of prayer, you have fraternity. But you also have that rooted in the natural bonds of affection. Whereas in a supernatural vocation that 
draws men into a community. You have this, transform, this transformational grace of community that is established almost entirely by supernatural grace and train whistles. <laughs> it might be okay. I can't. Tell uh, I can't how, either. I can't tell how yeah, bad it actually. The fourth or fifth time, I'm I'm just like, well, if it did it one time, it's gonna. <laughs> we all need prayer. So monks praying can't be our get out of prayer free card, you know. And yet, and yet, if we read First Corinthians seven carefully, it talks about how a single man or a single woman committed to the Lord is not anxious to please another in that relationship. Mm -hmm. The list of tasks that have to be attended to um, can be so great. And for someone in a monastery, they can make their primary work prayer. Um, not that they don't have tasks to do as well, but there can be a focus as they're single-mindedly, single-heartedly pursuing that relationship with Christ. And there is a great benefit to lay people because they're doing that. Not that we're exempt from prayer, but it undergirds in ways we don't even understand our culture uh, at large, but also the culture of the families around it. Um, it's an important example for us. It's an important um, model of tending the garden of their souls and and I hope that we will follow their example. Uh, I, have a, I have a sense that older age is, is more of that for a lot, of, a lot of people. I see that in my parents. I see that in, in a number of older people um, who no longer are busy with children and, and even grandchildren living close by. Um, but they are able to do at a much earlier age and hopefully garner great wisdom through it as they draw close to Christ that we will then benefit from as they share um, what they're learning and, and how they're learning. Um, so. Can I share one or two other thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you thought um, more about it. I yeah, think. I have. And I, I wanted to say too that, you know, first of all, church history reveals that the places where Christianity once flourished but then was uprooted were often the places where monasticism was not deeply rooted. Conversely, places like Egypt and elsewhere, you'll see Christianity has survived against very vehement anti-Christian forces, especially because of the strength of monasticism. Another thought too, you know, when you look at the relationship between the old and the new in scripture, I, I like to point out that the covenant is a family bond, but you can have fatherhood and motherhood according to the flesh that the spirit blesses, along with brotherhood and sisterhood with the natural bonds. But the new covenant is like fatherhood according to the Spirit, and motherhood too embodied in the Blessed Virgin, and brothers and sisters. And so we don't call abbots abbots just for convenience. It's because Abba, they're father figures. And likewise, in a monastery, there is a fraternity there that is baptismal first and foremost, as well as Eucharistic. And they share this common vocation to be brothers in a spiritual family. And you can see where this covenant faithfulness is able to flourish there in a way that really exemplifies what Jesus came to bring us. You know, obviously the two are united, but we distinguish between families in the natural order and families in the supernatural order. But related to this, I would say that in our day, in our church, in our own faith tradition, the natural family represents sort of like the infantry in the church militant. Whereas the monasteries and the convents, and especially the cloistered convents, spiritually speaking, represent the high command. They're the ones whose prayers and sacrifices are drawing down immeasurable graces for us to live family life, to be faithful in marriage, to be fruitful in our apostolic work and that sort of thing. So just as one hand washes the other, so the marital vocation, along with consecrated celibacy, are coordinated by God to bring about uh, something that I'm really looking forward to seeing more of because I am convinced the biggest telltale sign that the new evangelization is succeeding, gaining traction, truly growing, is if and when monasticism truly flourishes. For more from St. Benedict's Abbey in Atchison, Kansas, see our website, kansasmonks.org.